compelling detective story, a cloak and dagger action, and a romantic drama, all these stories were taken from real life. The history of Kazakhstan is inseparable from the world history. Reflections on history, our version. Abbott's Adventure. He tried not to think about the saber raised over his head. He didn't want to die. He was less lucky than Shakespeare, which was quite understandable because Shakespeare was the second to have encountered it. Resistance was useless as the number of attackers was too large. Defense Lisi lay bleeding in the Mangistau sands on the night of April. I connected my scattered thoughts. I summed up the full bitterness of my present condition, wounded helpless in the hands of robbers. Death threatening me at every moment, escape utterly hopeless, and worst of all, my mission lost. This is the spy thriller of the Queen Victoria times. Scene of action is Central Asia. Abbott was a person who didn't have the slightest idea of how to travel in such places. People do not prepare for a reconnoitering operation in such a way. It was really a risky venture. Shakespeare did actually succeed where Abbott had failed. Abbott failed in this mission. It is no mere chance that Big Ben, which faces the four corners of the earth, symbolizes the inviability of the British Kingdom and its imperial ambitions. The vector of British movement was already plotted, although Big Ben would be constructed only in 20 years. It was 1840. England was successfully advancing in the east and Afghan Herat had already been thrown at the Queen's feet. Russia was greatly disappointed by these facts. Officially, they were allies, but in fact, they were rivals. It was the Cold War of the 19th century and the battlefield was in Central Asia. Both Russia and England were interested in this area. According to some sources, James Abbott, who was the captain of the Bengal artillery, had undergone special training at a secret base in British India and specialized in the execution of secret orders. Historians do not rule out that England was preparing an armed intervention in the regions of the Aral Sea and the Caspian Sea. Kazakhstan could have become an English colony. It is natural that Russia had to show its influence in Asia. At that time, a lot of Russian captives were in Hiva, and Governor General Pirovsky went from Orenburg to liberate his compatriots. Later, James Abbott went there from Afghan Hera, too. The British officer had a difficult and strange task. He had to mediate between Russia and the Khanate of Hiva. They sent Abbott uh, to Hiva with the aim of persuading the Khan to liberate um, as many slaves as possible and send them back to Russia. In this way, they wanted to prevent the Russians from waging a war against Hiva. He was wearing Afghan clothes, could not speak either Russian or any of the local dialects. He had some escorts and was planning to persuade the Khan of Hiva to support England. And he also planned to carry out some secret tasks. While the agent had complete freedom of action, it was up to him how to go, where to go and how to act. It was important to attain the goal. The Khan of Hiva first thought that Abbott was a Russian spy. He was really surprised because if Russia and Britain were enemies, why did Abbott want to buy out Russian captives? Although he failed the mission, he was not killed, despite the fact that they were going to do it. Nevertheless, they even provided him with guides and gave a letter from the Khan to the Tsar. The mysterious letter contained an offer to stop the war, return Hiva merchants who had been detained in Orenburg, and after that exchange the captives. Thus, Abbott, after all, had an excellent pretext, and he went to embark on the mission. This letter would later influence the agent's destiny. It was not an easy journey. It was March, it was slushy and raining in some areas. There were no people around. They often slept outside near nomads' camps. I wandered toward the nearest Cossack tents, which I found preparing for removal. The tents and baggage being packed upon about 16 camels led by the women. The children were securely packed above the baggage. Yes. 
все, что он видел по, по пути и казалось, He wrote down everything he saw on the way and found interesting. We passed the Aral Sea and were dazzled by its glitter. Dirty spots of melting snow were in the steppe. My arms are purple and they're so cold that I cannot even move them. However, my legs stay warm as I'm wearing cotton socks, goat wool stockings and also wolf wool ones. I'm also wearing huge Persian boots. It is surprising that I still can't move. There were a lot of everyday details in Abbott's recollections. Of course, he did not give any details. He did not mention that he had been given a secret task. I listened earnestly. Not a sound was stirring, excepting the faint murmur of the waves of the Caspian as they fell amongst the rocks below. The Caspian itself lay smiling before me, blue and serene as the unclouded heavens, without a sail, without an arc of refuge, cold and pitiless as the grave. Although his guide promised that they would go to Astrakhan, they could not do it. Nobody was waiting for them and the guide was faced with a difficult choice. He could either go forward to the Russians or return to Hiva, which he considered a disgrace. Abbott, together with people whom he didn't trust, went to the steppe. I'm watching all the gestures and glances and trying to guess if I'm facing any danger or not. He wrote this near the fire. He didn't sleep at night and was sure that it saved him from being stabbed with a knife. However, it turned out that he would face the main danger later. Chapter 2. Captured by the steppe. The branch of Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which was concerned with Asia, was in Orenburg. Meanwhile, Perovsky, who was the governor of Orenburg, had lost a quarter of his troops before he could reach Hiva. As a result, he had to return. Their first attempt to execute a winter campaign did not even end in defeat. They did not even run into their enemies because they froze. So Abbott's efforts were not necessary as Russian troops were not ready for the campaign. They thought that they would quickly pass the polar freeze area and afterwards would not need warm clothes. Although a lot of time passed after Russia entered those areas, their knowledge was not profound at all. Abbott knew even less about the geographical features and had no idea about Perovsky's failure. He was not lucky. He had chosen a guide who betrayed him in the end. It is difficult to say who attacked him. During the journey, he noticed that some riders were following them at some distance, but then they disappeared in the steppe. From time to time, Abbott put his ear to the ground to hear the sounds of hooves. Apparently, the caravan was really being followed. During the evening prayer, the Cossacks from an unknown clan attacked us. There were 50 of them, and soon Kari headed them. They wounded my head with an axe. All the others were wounded too. They cut off Abbott's finger, and it hung on a piece of skin. We heard from the Cossacks that the Khan of Hiva had ordered to rob us. Any criminals could have killed him on the way, and nobody would have known that he had been here. The Briton was knocked down and deprived of the gun he had never parted with. He had a limited choice, which was either slavery or death. I held my breath sometimes to assist the escape of my spirit. But the swoon was only momentary. My senses and my reason returned, clear and calm as ever. Just then, a Cossack bent over me and thrust his hand into my bosom as if to ascertain whether I still lived. Perhaps he was lucky enough because he survived in spite of the wounds he had received. It is not clear what exactly saved the Englishman. Miraculously, an agent with money who had been sent to him from Herod appeared in Mangistau's steppe. Abbott said that the letter from the Khan of Hiva to the Russian Tsar had helped too, because the robbers had been frightened. However, his servant's version was different. This incident occurred not far away from the place where nomadic Cherkes Batir and Arimbai Cossacks were. 
They heard the noise and shouts, came there and stopped the robbers. During this time, they took part of the money and possessions from the robbers, who had taken them from us earlier. How they reached an agreement remains unknown, but they released the Englishman and his people, and espionage mission proceeded. Chapter 3. Agent James Alexeyevich Meanwhile, unbelievable rumors that an Englishman with an army consisting of 10,000 people was approaching Alexandrovsky Fort spread, and the fortress prepared to repel the British spies' attack. Nobody could speak English, and Abbott's explanations were not understood. However, by chance, as in spy thrillers, scientist Alexander Lehmann, who had taken part in the unsuccessful campaign against Hever, was in the fort. Both the scientist and the Englishman could speak French. <laughs> He came to the fortress and surrendered to the Russian troops, asking to send him to St. Petersburg. The square fortress faced the steppe and the sea. The fort was on a high cliff. Here, Abbott was provided with medical treatment. His finger was amputated. He was also told that he couldn't get to either St. Petersburg or Astrakhan and was sent to Guri van der Skort. The troops were returning from Hiva. Perovsky did it so that he could not see that the troops were in adverse conditions after the military campaign. So he sent him to Ural, to the north. It took 10 days to get to the mouth of the Ural by sea. Abbott wrote that Commandant Guriev was a really worthy man. He let him live in his flat and the Englishman was astonished by its luxury. The town had also impressed the intelligence agent. The beauty of bushes, gardens and trees met all the standards of a little but pretty fishing town. He also liked local songs, dances, girls and hospitality. The agent was treated to caviar and salted fish. They called him James Alexeyevich and a couple of days later sent him to Uralsk. It was a boring town. Two balls were organized for Pushkin, who was there for three days, perhaps because he was an honored guest. Life was boring there, and the town was dirty. However, Abbott, who visited the town just a few years after Pushkin was there, had a different opinion about the town. I was indeed delighted with Uralsk, and my people were wonderstruck. To them, it was all enchantment. The wide, free, clean street, the elegant houses, the least a palace in the eyes. The beautiful women dressed in a costume quite new to them and elegant in the eyes of the most fastidious walking unveiled. Here he finally met a person who could speak English fluently. This person was scientist Platon Chikhachov, another member of the campaign against Hiva. The exhausted Englishman expressed his thoughts about this meeting in quite a poetic way. It is like the appearance of the first bird from your homeland. It is flying near the ship of a person who travels without a compass and a map and is exposed to the elements. He spent a few days in Uralsk and finally arrived in Orenburg, the city where all the people coming from Hiva were sent. In this city, the Central Asian adventures of the Englishman finished. As for the crucial letter sent from the Khan of Hiva to the Russian Tsar, it was found out in Orenburg that it had been written by Abbott. Epilogue Mission is feasible. Captain of the Bengal army, Richmond Shakespeare, was not related to the great playwright in any way. He just bore the same family name. Nevertheless, he was a cousin of another classic, William Thackeray. As Shakespeare did not receive any information about Abbott, he decided to find him. He also started his journey without a compass and map, exposed to the elements, trying to achieve fame and ranks. Shakespeare did actually succeed where Abbott had failed. The Khan of Hiva, who was frightened even by the unsuccessful campaign led by Perovsky, decided to release 400 captives in exchange for his merchants. Shakespeare, who was a member of this court, also went to Alexandrovsky Fort. Moreover, the enterprising Englishman took the credit for saving the captives, due to which he was knighted later. He did his best to use Abbott's failure as a requital. Actually, it is quite strange that he helped the enemies to buy out the captives and was rewarded for this. However, he was not met warmly in Russia and was immediately sent to his homeland. Three years later, a report about James Alexeyevich's journey to Central Asia was published in London. It was written like an adventure novel. Later, Abbott was knighted too. 
So apparently, he did accomplish his mission. Thank you.